It's time for another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These questions and comments typically come from comments on the videos on YouTube and on library, or sometimes through social media, such as my followers over on Mastodon, uh, Reddit, also, sometimes I get questions through email. The very first question I want to address today is, Hey DT, could you please let your hair grow out? I want to see you in some hairstyle. Please, it's a request from the community. I get this request a lot, and I know a large percentage of my viewership wants to see me grow out my hair. You guys want to see what my hair actually looks like. I'm kind of interested in it too. It has been two decades since the last time I grew a full head of hair, and I'm not bald. I can actually grow hair. But here's the thing. I don't know what that hair would look like. It's been so long since I actually had hair. I have no idea. Is is it straight? Is it curly? And, you know, when I grow it out, it could be completely different than what it was when I was a kid. You know, could it be gray, which it probably would be there? Would, it, at least it would be salt and pepper. I'm already getting some gray in my beard uh, when I really have the camera settings, you know, contrasted right the white hairs will just jump out on the screen on my camera and i know i'm gonna have a lot of white probably in my hair because you know i'm in my mid 40s now and i know sometimes when i tell you guys my age some of you guys are a little shocked by that a lot of you guys think i'm younger than i am and part of the reason many people think i'm younger is the fact that i shave my head so i i think and growing a head of hair, especially if it was salt and pepper or even mostly gray, it would definitely age me a lot. And I'm just not wanting to do that. The next question is, hey, DT, what is your motivation for doing Linux videos? It sounds like Linux isn't necessarily what you do in your free time anymore. So what keeps you going and what is your ideal goal with this? So there's a lot of parts to this question. Let's start with... He mentions I don't do Linux in my spare time anymore. I, I've talked to you guys about this. I actually don't watch like YouTube content, you know, other Linux content very much in my free time. You know, typically I spend a few hours a day doing Linux stuff on my computer for making content for my YouTube channel. And in my free time, I'm not also going to do that, you know, go watch uh, video content about Linux or, you know, reading through the Arch Wiki or things like that. You know, after spending several hours working with Linux, then in my free time, I'm also not going to go spend a few hours working with Linux, too. So in my free time, I try to do things that are not at this computer. So in my free time, you guys know I spend a lot of time at the gym. You know, I try to work out a lot. I, uh, I like to spend time with friends and family, you know, it's, at least once a day, I try to get away from this computer for a couple of hours. You know, I'll get in my car and go somewhere. Even if I have no idea where I'm going, I'll figure it out on the way. But I can tell sometimes I'm sitting at this computer and doing things and I've been at it for a few hours. My eyes start getting tired and I start getting a little antsy. You know what? I'm done, get in the car, go do something, then come back, finish what I'm doing at the computer. I think taking breaks, especially when you're working long hours at a computer, is very important. But I think uh, the person that asked this question was trying to relate me not doing a lot of Linux in my, quote, free time and maybe not having motivation for doing Linux videos. I love doing the Linux videos. It's just, you know, it shifted from I used to do Linux videos in my free time to where now I do Linux videos as a job, basically. But that's really the only change. It's just, you know, a flip flop from what used to be work to free time is now what I'm doing for work. As far as the ideals or the goals of the channel, the goals of the channel mainly are to help people. That's typically what it is. It's mainly about education. I'm trying to get people to go further in their Linux journey than maybe they otherwise would if people like me didn't put out this kind of content. And the next question is, hey, DT, what's the point of spending time between different window managers when they all try to accomplish the same things? What are the points that a new window manager user should check? And this is a question I often get from people that don't understand why I have tried out so many different window managers or why other people also are trying out these other window managers. Many of you guys that view the content of the channel, many of you guys have hopped between a bunch of different window managers too, maybe because of my content. And 
What's the point of doing that? Well, there's several points, but uh, A, it's fun, right? It's fun. One of the things when you're new to Linux, especially new to tiling window managers, maybe new to bash scripting and things like that, when you're just new to this stuff, is you need practice at doing it. And configuring a window manager, you know, that takes some work. And, you know, when you do it for the first time, that's great. You know, you pick your first window manager and let's say it's the awesome window manager and you configure it and you have this gorgeous, awesome desktop. Well, that's great. You went through the trouble. You really learned some things. But now you, you even though you did it one time, you really should do it more than one time. Well, you can't go back and reconfigure awesome because you know how awesome works now. What you should do is then go try and configure a different window manager that uses a completely different scripting language. And, you know, the more you do this, the easier it gets. You will be surprised. You know, the very first window manager, especially tiling window managers, the very first tiling window manager you try to configure and set up, it's going to take you weeks to do that thing. The next one, it's not going to take you nearly as long. And eventually it gets to the point where you can pretty much configure any window manager or desktop environment to your liking rather quickly once you kind of know what you're doing with this stuff. Ultimately, I think just trying out different window managers actually makes you a stronger Linux user. So yeah, I, I recommend window manager hopping. So many people waste time distro hopping, right? And ultimately hopping between one distro to the next doesn't matter nearly as much as you know some of the stuff that's actually running on those distros like the window manager. The next question is, hey, DT, I've never understood anime. Is it just weird cartoons? I don't know. I, I think it's just weird Japanese underage girl cartoons. That's my impression of it, but I don't know. I've never actually sat down and watched it. I just don't think I could. <laughs> I don't, I'm not the anime kind of person, but it is weird how so many millions of Americans are into this stuff. I don't know if maybe a lot of Americans are really interested in maybe Japanese culture. There's a, certainly a lot of Japanophiles in American culture, in American society, people that are interested in the Japanese culture, but I don't understand why they're interested in Japanese cartoons. It's a little odd to me, especially, you know, in certain areas of the internet you go to, it's like anime is the topic of discussion, even when it shouldn't be. Like over on 4chan, you know, there's anime uh, 4chans, but even if you're in the political 4chan or the technology 4chan, all the topics are about anime. I don't understand what the deal is. And, and yet they have so many different sub-genres of anime, like tranime. What the hell is that? The next question is, hey DT, will you make videos on evil mode for Emacs noobs who are comfortable with Vim and are considering to switch over? Uh, no, I probably won't because this is not something I really could do because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I understand why you asked the question, but if you're already comfortable with Vim, then I don't need to make a video about evil mode in Emacs for you because evil mode in Emacs is basically a complete Vim emulation layer, right? If you know Vim, then you know evil mode in Emacs. I, we don't have to discuss it any further than that. The, if you didn't know Vim, that's when I would have to go and make a, a specific video about evil mode in Emacs. But if you already know Vim, if you've been through the Vim tutor, then you can start editing in Doom Emacs on second one when you install it because all your Vim commands work inside Doom Emacs. So it's not really evil mode that I would need to show you. It's everything but evil mode. <laughs> so that's really what you need to do. You don't, you can learn about evil mode, but what you really need to learn is just how Emacs works. You know, you need to know that Meta X, Alt X on the keyboard is, brings up a uh, run prompt where you can actually run various programs, modes, extensions inside Emacs. You need to learn how the package manager inside something like Doom Emacs works. Uh, just Go through some of my videos. I've done some videos on the basics of getting started with Doom Emacs. Other than that, if you already know Vim, you, you know how the text editing and everything works in Doom Emacs already. I, I don't need to make a video specifically about evil mode. And the next question is, hey DT, I set up my laptop with Arch Linux and your config files, but one thing I was unable to do is the screen brightness and volume thing. My brightness and volume keys don't work. Can you suggest me a solution? Okay, so... If you're using my config files and you know some commands that I'm using with my key bindings are not working, are those programs that are in my config files, are those programs actually installed? So 
check that. Go in that config and you see the key binding and you see the command. It, it should be running. Copy that command. Open a terminal. Run that command in the terminal. You're probably going to get an error. It's probably going to say command not found, meaning that program that you're trying to run is not installed on your computer. Install it. If the program is actually installed, you know, that command actually does work, then it's probably a problem with your key binding. Make sure in certain window managers, you can't have the same key binding for different things. Make sure it's not a duplication of another key binding somewhere else. The other thing is if you're using some weird keys on the keyboard, such as some of the media keys or things like that, because you mentioned a brightness and volume, you may be trying to use, you know, some of the weirder keys on a 110 key keyboard. Make sure the key binding actually specifies specifies the correct name for that key with that window manager. And the final question I want to address was really a lengthy email that I received from a longtime viewer of the channel. And I'm going to summarize kind of what he was asking. This was in response to a video I did where I was live streaming playing the game Zero AD, a great free and open source uh, strategy game, real time strategy game. And this particular viewer writes, Hey, I've never had a machine that could run the game zero AD, but I've always wanted to. My question is, isn't the game sexist because you told about the game and what units are best to do things in the game. Women are weaker than men and they're not as strong. They have less hit points. In my opinion, every human can do everything, some better than others, no doubt, but the gender has mostly nothing to do with it. I'm just surprised because you present that while you criticize some codes of conduct. And he mentions this code of conduct thing because I have criticized a couple of different codes of conduct in the past, in particular, Gnome's code of conduct, because I think it is uh, rather bigoted in its language. It's got some rather divisive language in it, but I, I will address some of what he said here. He mentions he would like a machine that could run zero AD. Zero AD, you do need a halfway decent machine to run it. It would be great if you had a machine that had an okay CPU and probably a dedicated GPU as well. It doesn't need to be you know just a high-end machine, but you probably can't run zero AD if your machine is a complete potato. As far as the game being sexist, I, I don't think the game is sexist at all. There is nothing wrong with men and women being different because men and women are very different. <laughs> There's clearly a difference between the genders. We all understand that. And that's not to say that men and women are not equal. You're right. Men and women are, quote, equal. But when, when we talk about that, we're not saying that men and women are the same. Men and women are equal you know, as the founding fathers of the United States, you know, the, there's that line, all men are created equal. And when they say men, they're also including women. All, all people are created equal. They're talking about we're all equal in the eyes of the government, all equal in rights, all equal in the eyes of God. You know, they're they're not talking about everybody's the same. Saying everybody's the same is just insulting. That's saying there's no individuals out there. You know, individualism doesn't matter to anybody. Everybody is the same. And that's just insulting to every single one of you watching this. If, if people are telling you that, no, no, we should embrace rugged individualism. I think that's a healthy thing in society. As far as saying that men and women you know, are not equal or men and women are different. Well, that's obvious, right? That's not being sexist. You know, there are things that men and women do better than the other sex. And this game, Zero AD, is a historical game, right? And historically... When you're building an army, you build an army of men. You don't build an army of women. Why is that? It's because of nature. Men are typically bigger than women. Men are typically stronger than women. Men are, have natural advantages to get bigger and stronger. You know, testosterone, for example, you know, hormones. Uh, we're built for fighting, <laughs> historically speaking. Women are not. That's what the game reflects. And quite frankly, that's what nature reflects. To pretend otherwise is to deny, I guess, the natural order of things. And, you know, saying that men are better at some things than women, generally speaking, that's not sexist because I think women are better than some things, generally speaking, than men. I think women obviously are much better at nurturing, caretaking. You know, they just have that it's naturally built into them in a way that it's just not in men. I think that's why so many women are 
teachers and nurses. Uh, you know, obviously women bear children. Men can't. So obviously they're superior to, to men than that. But just not even being able to have a child, but raising a child. I think we can all acknowledge women are just better suited, generally speaking, than men. Ultimately, anybody that tries to say that men and women are equal in all things, I think people like that are just denying reality and I kind of feel sorry for them. I do think everybody is equal in rights. That's un unquestionable. And, and the codes of conduct I have criticized in the past, that's why I've criticized them, is because they tried to marginalize certain groups as far as rights. The Gnome Code of Conduct, for example. They specifically say that they want to favor certain groups within the population and that other groups in the population, they want to try to marginalize. They want to shun them and they really don't want to hear from these particular people. <laughs> and that obviously is bigoted. That's prejudiced. And I just can't stand the Gnome Code of Conduct. And quite frankly, I just can't stand the Gnome Foundation. One of the things that I don't like about just code of conducts in the tech industry, to generally speaking, we're talking about the difference between men and women. The fact is, you know, a lot of these codes of conduct talk about, hey, we need to get more women into tech. It's all men. It's like 95 percent men when we talk about the people that are doing Linuxy stuff, open source stuff. But <laughs> the reality is this. Women are, yes, yeah, they're underrepresented. In technology. The reason they're underrepresented in technology, we've already talked about this. Men and women are wired differently. Men generally gravitate to things like building things, you know, building uh, cars and houses and software, right? That's kind of what we do. We're the builders. Women, they're wired differently. They go toward, you know, more uh, you know, that, that, that caretaking, that nurturing kind of thing. You know, they go they have different kinds of career paths that they generally gravitate toward. And it's not because society pushes them that way. Society doesn't, you men, <laughs> did society push you to your career path? I don't think a single man here would say that society pushed them to go in a direction of, that they chose as far as a career path. And I don't think any woman would say that either. I think just men and women naturally gravitate toward different things. And that's why men like tech. Women don't. And to try to force women into tech and to try to force some men out of tech to make things balanced is ridiculous. I, I think those people, again, they're just denying the reality of just nature and the differences between the sexes. That was a great question to end on. Today is December 24th, Christmas Eve. So I do want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of the show. I need to thank Devin Fran, Gabe, Corbinia Mitchell, Akami, Arch5530, Chris, Chuck, David, the other David, Donnie, Dylan, Gregory, Lewis, Paul, Pick, BM, Scott, and Willie. They are the producers of the show. They are my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these names you see on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because... DistroTube is sponsored by you guys, the community. If you'd like to help me out, consider supporting me over on Patreon. Look for DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace. <laughs>